Really? A DDR5? How interesting can that be? Well, we can ramble. Get it? Ramble. With the launch of a new socket, LGA1700, Intel's Alder Lake has come to life. It's hard to believe that it's been almost six months. And that brings with it DDR5. <laughs> DDR5, uh, the track record so far, it's not been great. Supply issues, what has been supplied into the market, not really all that fast. And performance, eh, not a lot of different over DDR4. That is finally, finally starting to change. This kit of A-Data Memory XPG is the fastest DDR5 kit that I've tested so far, DDR5 6000. And if you were shopping for DDR4 memory in the past, you'd know that sometimes they play a little fast and loose with the timings. With DDR4, it was possible to get a DDR4 3600 kit that was actually slower than a DDR4 3200 kit, at least when you benchmarked it and it came to the games. And the reason for this is the timings. Most of the time, the memory is advertised with at least the first timing number. Gamers Nexus actually did a good video on the complexities of the timing and you know it's like you have a row change time and a command time and what's the command rate CR1 to CR2. I don't really want to rehash that although that might be an interesting video because DDR5 is a little bit more nuanced because there's two channels that are half as wide on each memory stick. It's not really exactly correct to call it. I mean it is four channel but each channel is only half as much bandwidth as DDR4, so it's effectively the same bandwidth, and they do that for latency reasons. But yeah, anyway, I'm getting off track. DDR5, 6000. So when I tested this, I was expecting it to really not be a lot different than other kits of memory. You know, we sort of launched with uh, DDR4, you know, 2400 slash 4800, 2400 megahertz, 4800 megatransfers per second uh, is sort of what we launched with. So from 4,800 to 6,000 is a pretty big uplift. And I was kind of surprised when we're working with, you know, a 3090 or a 6900 XT GPU, the very highest end of the market right now, and we're talking about things like 1080p gaming, the extra memory does actually help. It can be as much as 2, 3% difference for those high frame rates. So I decided to do some comparisons. I've got some Kingston HyperX memory, that's 5,200. I've got some 5600 G-Skill Trident Z, and this running at 6000. Now, I really expected it, you know, like I say, for there not to be a lot of difference between, say, you know, 5600 and 6000, but surprisingly there was, because in DDR4, I've come to expect shenanigans, but there wasn't. A-Data's actually got a good product here. The secondary timings and the tertiary timings on this look pretty good, as evidenced by the actual transfer rates in A-to-64. So if you look at this kind of a benchmark and you side by side by side each memory, you can see exactly what you're getting in terms of performance uplift and you can see exactly what you're getting in terms of uh, latency. Latency I think is also very important and a lot of people don't really uh, talk about latency when they're doing these kinds of benchmarks, but we got all the way down to about 71 nanoseconds from over 80 nanoseconds in the baseline configuration. Now for the baseline testing, that was a stock JEDEC standard, JEDEC is the standard that, you know, sort of DDR5 was implemented at, is the completely standard 4800 mega transfers. And if you notice, 1.1 volts. When you want to run faster, you need more voltage. So in the uh, SPD, in the profile, as reported by CPUZ, we can see, oh, look, it's going to bump it up to 1.2 volts. In terms of the ability to tune the memory and get a little bit better performance, you can get down to about 68, 69 nanoseconds. I don't think it's worth your time to spend a lot of time trying to dial into your, your memory, especially if you use your machine for something other than gaming, because it can introduce instability. One of the main places that the instability will get introduced at is wake from sleep. So when the machine goes to sleep, the, the memory is not exactly off, but it's not exactly on either. And that critical sort of wake up thing uh, is really hard to get right, and DDR5 was a little rushed. And so especially early kits, it's like wake from, wake from sleep because your computer doesn't do anything. You might be pushing the overclock just a little too much. Sometimes a BIOS update will help with that. Sometimes there's new timing tables from manufacturers that will help with that. But in general, yeah. 
Now our test system was with the MSI Supreme 3090, one of the highest end graphics cards you can get. And on the Team Red side, we were testing with the ASRock 6900 XT. No stability issues, no performance issues, no weird glitches, no gotchas. So I'm very satisfied with this kit of memory from ADATA. There's nothing uh, untoward going on under the hood. And it really is DDR5-6000. It is worthy of the DDR5-6000 label, even offering a little bit of a performance uplift over our DDR5-5600 kit. I mean, it's only 400 extra mega transfers, another 200 megahertz, but it was actually surprisingly stable on our 12900KF. This is a recently produced 12900KF as well, so it's not quite the launch day 12900. Thought it would mix things up a little bit. And we're testing on an Aorus Master motherboard, but I also tested with the MSI EK Carbon X motherboard. No problems there. And actually, MSI has memory, try it, and I was able to get a little bit better performance out of it overclocking and doing things on that motherboard um, than this motherboard. I've got an upcoming build based around the Asus Strix Z690, and I'm gonna use this kit of memory in that build. We're gonna probably not have as high end of a GPU as a 3090 in that build, so I'm not expecting there to be a, you know, a huge performance difference, but we'll take a look, so look for that video. So the short version is, I'm pleased with this kit of memory from ADATA. It is as advertised, pleasantly surprised. I look forward to testing even more kits of memory because things are only just now starting to get interesting with DDR5. 5600, 5400, 5600, something like that is basically the floor, and we've got so much more room to go from here. Maybe we'll get back to sub 65 nanoseconds as the norm. I can dream, can't I? Uh, one thing I wasn't able to do with the overclocking was clear 100 gigabytes per second transfer. I got really close. You know, when we started out with 2400, and we look at the first number here from A to 64, it's basically how much, how much information can you transfer in a second. And the 100 gigabyte per second barrier will be an important one when it's finally broken. Out of the box, this kit doesn't break that barrier, but it comes dangerously close. And I think with a little tuning, I could get it hitting over 100 gigabytes per second and have it be stable for more than an hour. But uh, again, you know, how much, what's your time worth? Is that, is that time well spent or, or is that just bragging rights in a, you know, in a benchmark? But still, this is almost 20% above baseline when we're talking about DDR5 and quite the gap between the highest end DDR4 memory kits that are available. And with just two DIMMs, we're not really talking about a huge difference over DDR4 except the transfer rate, the transfer speed. So, big benefit there. If you do decide to overclock the memory a little bit, I'll give you a little bit of a warning. You can achieve an overclock that is stable, but the overclock is worse performance than something that is slightly worse numbers than the overclock. And the reason for that is because even though the DDR5 memory is not error correcting, there are error correcting mechanisms that are implemented in non-error correcting DDR5. Uh, DDR4 introduced some basic, you know, retransmit, retry functionality. DDR5 improves that retransmit, retry functionality. And so you can have an overclock that is perfectly stable because it's having errors, but it's retrying. You lose time when you're retrying. The latency will be a little bit worse. Your game might hitch or stutter a little bit more, even though you run something like ADA64, because ADA64 takes so long to run, on average over that long run, it looks like you're doing really well. But when you're playing a game, those spikes as you go, uh, you'll feel them and it will be a very bad experience. So don't overclock too much. You can get yourself into trouble, make your system unstable, and it can be hard to diagnose because the error correction mechanism is doing error correction, and it doesn't really have a, a clean way to bubble those errors up to the top to say, hey stupid, you're getting a lot of memory errors. Because then people would freak out, because under normal operation, you're still gonna get memory errors every now and then, and people would think something was wrong, so it's like, oh, we need to hide it from the consumers, ah. And like I said, even though this is not error correcting memory, error correcting memory adds another layer on top of this. And error correcting DDR5 is a thing that exists. And it may even be unlocked on Alder Lake in certain chipsets. I'm investigating that. I think that's a bias oversight, but we'll see. I wonder this is level one. This has been a fun chat or ramble, if you will, about eight ADA DDR5 XPG memory running at 6,000 megatransfers per second. I'm signing out and you can find me in the level one forums.